Welcome to your fake therapist. And now, here's Hog Nogger. Today, I'd like to share a letter that will doubtless resonate strongly with a number of you. The problems faced by Gareth and his brave but ultimately fruitless struggle to address these difficulties on his own are both touching and heart-wrenching. Gareth is not alone. The condition that afflicts him is so pervasive and destructive that it requires the full episode to address properly. Send me a letter And I will make you feel much better Gareth writes Dear Hognogger, It is difficult for me to write this, but my position is a desperate one And so I call on you for aid As a child, I suffered severely as a result of poor television reception The reception on our TV set was constantly snowy and wobbly. The other children at school teased me mercilessly about this, and I was too ashamed to invite any friends over to the house in case the TV set was on. So I endured a friendless childhood. My mother was sympathetic, but my father had no interest in spending any money on improving the reception. He just laughed and said I should be grateful that the TV didn't have his fist through it. I can say that ever since my father died in a freak electrical accident, my life has been much improved. I have secure employment, and I have been blessed with a wife and two children. However, things have taken a turn for the worse. We recently bought our first house, and I was dismayed to discover that the television reception was not flawless. The picture was slightly grainy and distorted. This brought all my bad childhood memories flooding back. But I was determined. I'm not going to be my father, I thought. My children will not suffer as I did. I set about diagnosing the problem. After several months of exhaustive tests... I determined that the problem lay in the external antenna, so I made further careful preparations and then clambered up onto the roof of the house to begin the repair work. I laboured in vain for several weeks until I struck upon the solution. I would need to hone the tips of the antenna until they had perfectly sharp, perfect points. Only then would we have perfect reception. And so it began. Each weekend, I spent ten hours a day, sometimes twelve, on the roof, filing, scraping, and abrading the antenna wire. Sometimes I thought I was close to that perfect keenness, but it was ever elusive, and always there were tiny corrections to be made. The end result of this sharpening process was that After a few months' work, the entire antenna had been ground down to nothing. We had no antenna. This did not improve reception. We have since bought and installed, at considerable expense, three new antennas, and I have whittled each down to nothing. I'm working on the fourth now, and I have found, to my dismay, that this work is no longer confined to my weekends. I've been sneaking up onto the roof after everyone else is asleep. My inability to solve this problem is causing some strain in our family and is impacting my performance at work. I'm obviously not doing this correctly and I'm beginning to lose hope. Please, if you'd explain to me how to sharpen the aerial properly, I would be ever, ever so grateful. Gareth Gareth I have good news and bad news. The good news is that you don't need any tips in aerial sharpening and you do not need to spend any more time on the roof. The bad news is that you have whittled away four expensive aerials in the futile attempt to improve your television reception. Since television reception is now digital rather than analogue, it tends to be all or nothing. 
the reception is either perfect or fails catastrophically. I'd need more information to be certain about this, but I'm pretty sure that your television reception is perfect and that you are experiencing psychological aftershocks as a result of your early life sufferings. As a result, you are experiencing localised visual distortions. These aftershocks, though, are not of the greatest concern, nor is the obsession that has resulted in the escalation of your roof clambering behaviour. In your case, the obsessiveness has its roots in your perfectionism and your inability to produce perfectly sharp antenna ends. Because this inability is connected to deep-seated issues with television reception, the continual frustration of your goals leads to an obsessive focus on those goals. If we can remedy the perfectionism, the obsession will fall away as a natural side effect of this treatment. Fix the perfectionism then, and not only will the obsession fade, but the scales will fall from your eyes and you will enjoy the visual bonanza that accompanies perfect television reception. Before we get started on the solution to your problem, I'd like to digress a little and congratulate you on following through with a clear, coherent line of thought. Your guiding principle seems to have been that causes resemble their effects. You traced back from an unwanted effect, unsharp television reception, to a resembling cause, the unsharpness of your aerial. You're in good company here. A great many important thinkers have used similar guiding principles. Consider the preformationists. The preformationists likewise leaned on the idea that causes resemble effects. If we think of your existence as a man, as an effect, it must have been caused by something similar. The preformationists thought that inside either a woman's egg or a man's sperm, was a complete little human. There was controversy over whether little humans were to be found in men's testicles or in women's ovaries, but let's ignore this complication for the moment. According to the preformationists, you existed as a complete, fully formed little human inside, let us say, your father's testicles long before your birth. The existence of this little human is a distant cause of your current existence as a full-grown man. Now, some people noted the implication that if the little person inside the father's testicles is fully formed, then that little person would itself have ovaries or spermatozoa, which would themselves contain further little men and women, and so on, and so on. Some found this troubling but others noted that it gave a very neat explanation of the Christian doctrine of original sin. They claimed that the whole of the future human race was contained, Russian doll-like, within Adam's non-empty ball sack. This gives us a very neat explanation of why we are inherently depraved and sinful. We were all part of Adam at one point so we are all complicit somehow in his disobedience towards God. I mention all of this just to cheer you up a little bit before we get down to hard solutions. Your root problem is perfectionism, and we will now tackle this problem head on. I don't suggest that you immediately stop going up to the roof and shaving down the antenna. This might be an overwhelming task for you at present. What I do suggest, though, is that you take steps to lessen your perfectionistic tendencies. Perfectionistic behaviour usually has company, and I have no doubt that you are perfectionistic about quite a number of other things in your life. In order to loosen the hold perfectionism has on you, it's important to allow yourself to bring about less than perfect outcomes and to make mistakes from time to time. To that end, I want you to start making more mistakes. It will be difficult at first. The first step is to make the mistakes, and through repetition, 
to become familiar with how it feels to make the mistakes. And gradually, you will accept that those unpleasant feelings do not really harm you. I want you to start by making mistakes in an environment that's safe for you, and then we can extend your mistakes to more challenging environments. So I want you to begin by making mistakes around the home. Drop a plate occasionally when you're washing the dishes. Forget your wife's next birthday. Start giving your children the occasional wrong answer when they ask you for help with their homework. Be creative and find other areas of your domestic life where error can be introduced. Push yourself to do this regularly and you will start to see improvements. It's important to be honest with your family, so tell them why you are making these mistakes and omissions. If they love you, they will understand and give you permission to make further mistakes. Your next task will be to transfer this behaviour to the wider world. Start bumping into random strangers on the street from time to time, and sometimes forget to apologise. Make some extra mistakes at work. Again, Explain to your employer and your co-workers why this is necessary. I must stress that this should all be done responsibly. You shouldn't extend this mistake-making to areas where it will endanger lives, such as driving or rock climbing. Remember to hold your breath while underwater, and so on. This should all be fairly obvious, but do contact me if you require further clarification. Maintain this behaviour for as long as you require. Once you notice that you are no longer climbing on the roof to repair your television antenna, keep these practices going for a further six months and then start tapering off. There are two more things I ought to add. First, a word of warning. It's tricky asking a perfectionist not to make mistakes and there are pitfalls to be avoided that lead you straight back to the original problem. Let me tell you about one of my patients. Let's call her Lucille. I was treating Lucille for this very same antenna sharpening problem. I had her follow the procedures I just outlined, and after a month or two, I asked how she was doing. Well, she produced all manner of charts, summaries, and statistical analyses plotting her number of mistakes per week against various domains and comparing her results on a week-to-week basis. I inquired, gently but firmly, and how many mistakes do these charts contain? It was only then that she began to grasp the true extent of her condition. Don't be like Lucille. And here is the second thing. It's possible that your wife and children will leave you after you explain your procedure for overcoming perfectionism. I do think this is unlikely. If they were going to leave, it probably would have been at some time during the first or second antenna. And that's good news, because it means that they probably do love you. But it's worth being prepared for the worst. Under no circumstances should you compromise your progress towards mental health by acceding to any demand that you stop making mistakes. If they stand in the way of your recovery, you should let them go. Should this happen, and you find that you miss your children, I offer a substitution. I will explain how you can create new children from a few simple materials that are easily obtained. Remember the preformationists? Well, if they were right, then within your very own testicles there already exist tiny, fully formed humans. Now, if you're alert, you'll quickly think of the obvious question. Is there a way to bring these tiny humans to an infant stage without any outside assistance, say, from a woman? Perhaps there is. Here, I refer you to the investigations of Paracelsus, who spent a great deal of time considering these matters in the 16th century. He informs us how it can be done. Let the sperm of a man be putrefied in a good glass, 
sealed up with the highest degree of putrefaction in horse dung for the space of 40 days or so long until it begins to be alive, move and stir, which may be easily seen. After this time, it will be something like a man, yet transparent and without a body. Now after this, if it be every day warily and prudently nourished and fed with the arcanum of man's blood, and be for the space of forty weeks kept in a constant, equal heat of horse dung, it will become a true and living infant, having all the members of an infant which is born of a woman, but it will be far smaller. This we call homunculus, or artificial man, and this is afterwards to be brought up with as great care and diligence as any other infant. He then goes on to explain that this is a great secret and a miracle of God, so we should all keep very quiet about it and not tell a soul. So there you are. I trust that this information will benefit a great many of you. This issue of perfectionism is close to my heart, by the way, and close to Flinky's too. Flinky and I had our own struggles with perfectionism early in our lives. When you live for hundreds or even thousands of years, it's easy to fall into the trap of perfectionistic thinking. After you survive the first few hundred years and realise that your mental and physical capacities remain undiminished, it sinks in that you are going to live for a very long time. At that point, suboptimal patterns of thought and behaviour are likely to surface. If you think you're going to live for hundreds or thousands of years, then it's easy to lose the sense of urgency you once felt about all manner of things. The sense of immediacy that once animated you can drop away and nothing seems like it needs to be finished today, or tomorrow, or even this decade. If I put a gun to your head and ask you to design a really good bridge in two days, I have no doubt that you will show me a completed design, however ill-considered, at the end of those two days. You won't say, oh, I couldn't sort this thing out to my satisfaction, so I'm not going to show you my plans. It's probably best if you just shoot me. But if I give you five years to do the design work, you're a lot more likely to fuss over the design and try to get it just so. Here's an example from Flinky's early life that illustrates this point nicely. As you might recall, Flinky transformed Caesar's life, and Caesar was immensely grateful and loved Flinky as he loved no other. Not long before his untimely death, Caesar asked Flinky if he'd help out with a small engineering problem. Caesar wanted to drain the Pontine marshes. These festering, stinking marshes were about 30 miles from Rome and a happy home for many malarial mosquitoes. The Romans at the time had no knowledge of this disease, but they knew enough. They knew that people tended to get sick and die rather a lot in the near vicinity of these marshes. In addition, this was unproductive land. Caesar wanted the marshes drained and the land reclaimed. This was a monumental project for that time and required a great deal of careful preparation. Flinky set to work on the planning at once. When the first Roman emperor, Augustus, had wrested control of Rome after Caesar's assassination, he wasn't immediately concerned with Caesar's grand project. But knowing that Flinky was a beloved friend of his fallen uncle, Augustus left him to his own devices, and so Flinky carried on with the planning. But eventually, Augustus became interested in draining the marshes and so consulted with Flinky to see how the planning was proceeding. Coming along nicely, but not quite there yet, Flinky replied. And this was what he said upon each further inquiry from the emperor. Augustus became increasingly frustrated. Then, two engineers, who were working under Flinky, but hoping to gain the emperor's favour, simply took the plans in their unfinished state to Augustus and passed the work off as their own. Flinky was unaware of this betrayal, and still being a comparatively young and inexperienced man, 
only in his early 500s, he assumed that he had somehow lost the plans and had to start again from scratch. Meanwhile, Augustus started the dredging of the Pontine marshes, working from these unfinished plans. And what was the end result of this work? Widespread flooding of the surrounding area. The plans failed catastrophically. It was a disaster. Augustus, who was in the region inspecting the work, almost got his feet wet. Flinky knew nothing of these entire proceedings until months had gone by. He remained immersed in his planning. He later confessed to me that the plans in their unfinished state would actually have done a reasonable, if imperfect, job had he been supervising the operations rather than his duplicitous, semi-competent underlings. The unfinished plans were actually sufficient for the task. The fact that Flinky expected to live such a long time distorted his thinking and stretched out his time frames beyond what was reasonable. He continued to work on the plans and only completed them to his satisfaction many years later, some five years after Augustus's death. And by that time, the new emperor Tiberius had little enthusiasm for the project, nor did the following emperor. It wasn't until Nero was looking for what we would now term a public relations coup in the wake of the disastrous fire of Rome that Flinky got a proper hearing. And Nero was wildly enthusiastic. Flinky was overjoyed. Finally, his long years of steadfast, exacting work would bear fruit. On what was to be the first day of the project, Flinky arrived on site in a state of barely concealed ecstasy to find nothing. No one was there. It turned out that Nero had had a last-minute change of mind. He was still interested in draining the marshes, but decided that the best way to achieve this was by embedding the original project in a grander one. He intended to start by building a canal. Not just any canal, mind you, Nero intended to drive the canal through a couple of mountains. Jean-Baptiste Louis Crevier takes up the tale. Nero began to pierce the hills and had that work so much at heart that he caused all the prisoners in the whole extent of the empire to be brought to Italy and would have even criminals condemned to labour instead of death. All his endeavours and expenses were useless. The scheme of the canal vanished away. All it was productive of was that by digging the earth of the canton of Secuta, the wine of that growth, which was reckoned one of the best in Italy, lost its quality. And Tacitus observes wryly, Nero, with his love of the impossible, endeavoured to dig through the nearest hills to Avernus, and there still remain the traces of his disappointed hope. The Pontine marshes were not drained for another 1,900 years. Flinky laid his perfect plan at the feet of Nero, but Nero was an impulsive, changeable dreamer. Had he laid his imperfect but still adequate plan at the feet of Augustus, things would have turned out very differently. In the intervening years, Many Italians have died by the proboscis of the malarial mosquito, and this has been a heavy burden for Flinky to bear. He learned much about the dangers of perfectionism as a result of these sorry episodes, and you should regard these incidents as a cautionary tale. The phrase, do what I say, not what I do, has a hollow, unsatisfying ring to it. But when those words issue from a man as steeped in hard-gained wisdom as Flinky, only fools ignore them. I hope you have learned a great deal today about the perils of perfectionism and of some practical strategies to overcome this problem. You may notice that I have placed some very small and insignificant errors in the production of today's podcast. It would have been easy enough for me to produce a perfect episode But the last thing I want is for some of you perfectionists who really, really need help to notice that the episode is perfect. 
Some of you might then think, Hognogger is telling me about the perils of perfectionism while producing perfect material himself. Either his advice is good, but he is a hypocrite, or he is a charlatan and his advice is bad. Either way, some of you would then be put off and would not follow through with the schedule of mistake-making that I have prescribed for your condition. But even if I had produced a perfect episode, the charge of hypocrisy simply would not stick. Producing something perfect does not make you a perfectionist. The maladaptive behaviours and thought patterns that define perfectionism arise out of struggle. If achieving perfection is not a struggle, then you are not a perfectionist. I am not a perfectionist, merely a supremely accomplished man. I fought my battles with perfectionism long ago. Thank you for joining us. Send me a letter at hognogger at gmail.com. Until next time, go imperfectly. When it's hard to smile And nothing seems worthwhile Hognogger, hognogger